Thanks to the organizers yeah, for uh, well making such a school possible, yeah, which is great, yeah, especially for the students, but also for us. It's a lot of fun. So, well, the presentation I'm going to give today yeah, is a condensed version of a seven-hour presentation that I gave in the Barcelona School, yeah, and uh, the very long uh, version of this presentation, yeah, can be. Uh, download it yeah, from that site, but you will receive you know, all the slides, yeah, so don't, don't take too, too many notes. Okay, and right away, so hoping it works, I come to this picture where you see a single pupil telescope of diameter D1, so typically one meter, and as we've seen uh, during uh, the previous presentations, yeah, presentations by uh, by uh, Martin Ash yeah, and uh, others, we know that the image that we see from a distant star yeah, doesn't reveal any information about the star itself. Yeah? So it can be a, a big star, a small star, well, having any strange shape, yeah? well, having any spectral type, yeah? you, you won't be able yeah, to, to get information from that star. And what we have learned yeah, is that the diameter of the central airy spot yeah, is in region 2.44 times the wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. Yeah? So what I've said is not totally true. You may get some information about the star. Yeah? If you get uh, this airy spot, could someone tell me what kind of information I may get from the star? There is something I can say. What I can say is that the angular diameter of the star is smaller than the airy disk. Yeah? And this is, a, well, something interesting in any case. Yeah? So the angular diameter of the star yeah, is smaller than the airy disk. Otherwise, what we would see is already the convolution yeah, of uh, the disk of the star by the point spread function. Yeah? Now, if I take a telescope with a slightly larger diameter, well, we've seen that what we are getting yeah, is a narrower yeah, central spot for the airy disk because D2 yeah, is larger than D1. But the image of the star is still like a dot. Yeah? So what I can say, so I assume that there is no atmospheric turbulence, of course, or that I, I make use of adaptive optics, is that the angular diameter of the star is smaller than this quantity. Now, well, if uh, the source I'm looking at yeah, is extended, yeah, what I basically see, and this is an image yeah, of the Earth yeah, from, uh, well, very far away, it is a convolution yeah, of the real image of the Earth yeah, by the point spread function. So it's a bit blurred. If the diameter is larger, well, I get a nicer picture of the Earth. And so, well, astronomers have always pushed yeah, to construct larger and larger diameter yeah, telescopes. And uh, of course, we know that there, there must be a limit yeah, above which you cannot go. So now, well, the big challenges yeah, are the ELT, TMT, GMT, yeah, but it's probably very unlikely that uh, astronomer will ever succeed yeah, to build uh, telescopes larger than 100 meters in diameter. Yeah. But, in the 19th century, you see that Fizo and Stefan just, uh, well, quoted that in terms of angular resolution, if you make use of two small apertures distance of a baseline B, big B, this would be equivalent in terms of angular resolution yeah, to a single dish which diameter yeah, is B. Yeah? So this is very interesting. So you may recover well, a uh, very high angular resolution yeah, along the baseline joining the two single aperture telescopes. Yeah? So, but to achieve yeah, this result, you need to recombine in a coherent way yeah, the two light beams. Yeah? And this is a big challenge in optical astronomy. Okay, now what we will see, yeah, but this is just the result, yeah, it's a summary of the lecture of today. What you will see in the focal plane, yeah, is still the airy disk, so this is the central spot, yeah? but you see that it, it's being crossed yeah, by fringes. 
and the interfringe yeah, is just equal to the wavelength divided by the baseline. Yeah? So from such uh, an image, what you can say is that the angular diameter of the star yeah, is smaller than lambda over b. Yeah? So it means you, you didn't resolve it, yeah, but you have an upper limit on the angular diameter. OK, so just summary, if I make use of a single dish telescope, yeah, I get a blurred image. If the diameter is a bit larger, yeah, it's still better. And now if I make use of a meter, of course, yeah, I assume here, when looking at this very detailed picture, that I made use of a two dishes yeah, separated by different baselines and different orientations, yeah, and that we, we made what we, we, we call aperture synthesis. And this is the subject of the, the lecture of today. So first, I'm going to well present yeah, different theorems which are very, very useful yeah, for students yeah, to know and to, to apply them. And the first uh, very important theorem yeah, is a convolution theorem, yeah, which Barry says that the image you see yeah, from a distant Earth is simply the real image, yeah, that the ideal image that you don't have, convolved with a point spread function. So in mathematical terms, yeah, so the distribution of the intensity as a function of the angular coordinates, yeah, is a convolution product yeah, of the real source image by the point spread function. And mathematically speaking, yeah, this is a convolution theorem that I, I shall detail in a moment because, well, there are some very young students here, bachelor degree, so I'll give a more intuitive approach of what is a convolution theorem in a moment. Yeah? So this is a real image, this is a PSF, and this is the result. Now, what you will see is that if you take a Fourier transform of this intensity, whoa. Okay. <laughs> so if we take the Fourier transform of the intensity, we know, well, this is a property of Fourier transform, that the Fourier transform of a convolution product is a simple product of the Fourier transform. Yeah? And now you could say, wow, if I want to recover that information, yeah, so this one, yeah, I could divide this quantity by this one and take the inverse Fourier transform. So it's what I'm going to do. Now, well, you see here there are some coordinates, yeah? So we are not anymore yeah, in the space of uh, angular coordinates, yeah? But since we take a Fourier transform, yeah, we have new coordinates, which are frequencies, yeah? So they are the inverse of angular coordinates, yeah? and they are called uh, space frequencies, but in fact they are angular space frequencies, yeah? So it's a one, the, the unit yeah, is one divided by an angle, okay? Well, here typically it's a baseline, U, uh, along one direction, divided by the wavelengths, and perpendicularly you define another angular, well, uh, space frequency, V, which is a baseline yeah, in the perpendicular direction divided by the wavelengths. Yeah? Okay, so what we do, I told you, let's take the inverse Fourier transform of that quantity, so we recover yeah, the real image as being uh, the inverse Fourier transform of that, because inverse Fourier transform of Fourier transform yeah, is just uh, the function itself, yeah? And we find that it is the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of this quantity divided by the Fourier transform of that one, yeah? Now you, you could think, wow, you know, bingo, yeah? We, we may recover yeah, the real source image, you know, while observing it with a small telescope of five centimeters, yeah? And uh, playing the game. No, it doesn't work because the reason it doesn't work is that uh, this function, the Fourier transform of the point spread function, yeah? is a low frequency uh, passband, yeah? So it cuts, yeah, all frequencies above, yeah, certain uh, critical value. So, well, basically you divide by zero, and, you know, this is mathematically not acceptable, yeah? So you may apply, yeah, this theorem, but one needs to know what you're doing, yeah? You have to be careful. So this is called deconvolution, in fact, yeah. Okay, about the convolution theorem. Yeah, so here I show, yeah, especially for young students, what is a convolution product of two functions. So here I have represented yeah, a function, well, it's a top hat function, 
So it's one if uh, x is smaller than the modulus of a divided by two and zero otherwise. So this is a function. Here is, there is a, another top head function, j, which is zero if uh, the module of x is larger than b divided by two. Now the convolution, you see what you do. You take the function j, then you take the function f, and you just turn it around, yeah, the axis, yeah, so you take it, its symmetric part. This is a minus x. And after, you just add uh, the quantity x, well, 0 unit, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And what you do, essentially, you calculate yeah, the intersection of the two surfaces, yeah, and you plot it as a function of the quantity x. And we see that, indeed, when the two functions are very far away, yeah, the convolution product is 0. As they start overlapping, yeah, where there is small intersections and bigger, bigger, and bigger, and we reach that plateau. And when uh, the f function goes on the other side, yeah, e decreases again. Yeah? This is a convolution product. Yeah? Now, in nature, yeah, well, can we see uh, examples of a convolution product? Yes. And you may see them almost every day. Here I give you an example. Yeah? Did you ever look yeah, on the ground yeah, when there is some sun? Yeah? You may see, that, well, many disks, many, many kind of disks. Yeah? And uh, well, they look like uh, images of the sun. Yeah? Well, this is a nice example, but this is a more typical example. You see there are bamboo trees. And just on the bottom, yeah, we see many small disks. Yeah? How does this happen? Well, let's remember the camera obscura. Yeah? So this is a box yeah, with just a small hole, pinhole. And then on the back of the box, yeah, let's put a paper, uh, butter paper. Yeah? Butter paper yeah? And let's look at the sun. Yeah? So what we see here on the other side is a projected image of the sun that is reversed. Yeah? Now we know that the angular radius of the sun, yeah? so you just, to hide the sun, yeah, you put your finger, which is about one centimeter wide, yeah, at a distance of 114 centimeter, about one meter, and you may hide the sun. Yeah? And so the angular radius of the sun is a 1 over 114 radian. Yeah? This is the definition of the angular diameter of the sun. So let's assume that the length of the box is 114 centimeter, what will be the size of the solar disk, the diameter of the solar disk projected on the box? How much? One centimeter, of course. This is obvious. Now the same happens, you know, when you have a tree with leaves, yeah? Very often there are holes in the trees, yeah? And so what you see on the ground, yeah, is just a projected images of the sun, which may look circular if the sun is at the zenith, and slightly elongated, yeah, if it's slightly away. Now, here also the angle is one of over 114 regions, which means that if you see a solar disk with a diameter of 5 cm, the distance between the solar disk on the ground and the hole in the tree is how much? 5 times 114. So 5.7 meters. Yeah? So now, on, from, from now, yeah? When you will see the solar disk, yeah, you will sing about me. Yeah? And this was the goal yeah, of this presentation. Now, about, uh, about uh, well, convolution product. Yeah? So this is a very nice experiment that I have in my office. Yeah? Here is a window oriented south. Yeah? And here, I just took a cardboard and made a small hole. Yeah? So typically, the size is between a half a centimeter or even three millimeters up to two centimeters. And you see there are different holes, different shapes. Here are just squares, here are just elliptical, star-like, square-like, and circular ones. Now, if you take a sheet of paper, yeah, just a normal sheet of paper, and put it very close to it, yeah, of course, the sun yeah, is eliminating the holes. What you see is almost the shapes of all the holes, yeah, okay? Now, if you go farther away, it gets blurred, yeah? And now, what is very funny, if you go far away, far, far away, 
what you see is that all the images here are images of the sun. Yeah? And uh, well, this is kind of magical, yeah? that it doesn't depend anymore on the shape of the holes that you are using. Well, neither on the size. What, what you could see is that the nicest image where we don't see it clearly of the sun is this one through the smallest hole. Well, this one is very nice too. And as you are using bigger holes, yeah, well, the image looks a little somewhat blurred. So now, well, to understand yeah, this, what you do is the following. If you have a small hole, and let's assume that the hole is a square, but I just take a, a small holes. Well, OK, I get uh, at some distance the image of the sun. Now I could say, OK, let's cover yeah, this whole shape. So I take another one. What I get, of course, it's another image of the sun slightly above. If I take it on the left side, well, it's uh, an image of the sun slightly on the left side. Yeah. So what I'm doing here, I'm just making a summation. Oh. I'm just making a summation, yeah, over, I would say, x prime, y prime, over the whole. So I just make, OK, here is a hole with the coordinates x prime, y prime. And I multiply it yeah, by the sun image but not at coordinate x, y, but at coordinate x minus x prime, y minus y prime. And I make a summation on x prime, y prime. And if you take a very large number of small holes, yeah, this is just a double integration yeah, of the whole function. So the whole function yeah, is 1 if you are inside the square and 0 if you are outside. So of x prime, y prime multiplied by the sun. So the sun image yeah, is just uh, the image of the sun that you would have at a certain distance if the hole was infinitely small. Okay? So here it's x minus x prime, y minus y prime, dx prime, dy prime. And this is what we call the convolution product yeah, of two functions. So it's a hole function convolved. So this is a product, convolution product, yeah, by the sun image. So we see if we are if we are very close yeah, to the window, of course the image of the sun here through a hole is something very tiny. It's like a direct function, yeah. So if this is a direct function here, well I just get the image of the hole. And if I go very far away, the hole looks very small compared to the sun image because if you go very far away, the image may get very large. And then uh, this one acts as a direct function, and then I recover yeah, the image as being that of the sun. And at all intermediate steps, what I see is just a convolution product. Now I have a question for you. So this is uh, well, what I, I've written on the, on the, on the board. Let's assume that the hole is a heart, yeah? And that I'm looking at the, at the sun. If I look very, very close to the heart, what do I see? What? The heart. Is it reversed or is it the same direction? Same direction. In which color? Yellow. Yeah, this is... Now, if I go very far away, what do I see? The sun, upside down, yeah, correct. Okay, so now here is the layout of the lecture of today. So, I shall proceed now with a few reminders. Then, uh, a brief history of stellar diameter measurements. Then, I shall introduce yeah, the, the way an interferometer with two telescopes work. Then I think well, the very important part yeah, of the talk today will be about the coherence of light yeah, that was already uh, presented yeah, in, uh, by uh, France yeah, with, uh, of course, uh, an outcome the zernik Vansittart theorem, then uh, examples of optical interferometers, then some results, 
And then uh, three important theorems, but convolution theorem is already presented here. So let's go. So while measuring the angular diameter of a star, yeah, it's just like measuring the angular diameter of a filament, yeah, while being very far away and using uh, very simple tools. And uh, there will be, um, well, an experiment yeah, that will be carried out by you yeah, in uh, some, some moments. Now, you see, instead of uh, measuring the filament diameter, astronomers are interested in measuring the angular diameter of a star. Yeah? So the angular diameter of a star yeah, is a linear radius divided by the distance, of course. Yeah? Now, twice the linear radius is a linear diameter, and twice the angular radius is an angular diameter. Yeah? Now, wh what we know is that the flux yeah, at the surface of a star yeah, is just the apparent flux measured on Earth yeah, divided by the square of the angular diameter of the star. Yeah? So this is very simple to, to demonstrate. Yeah? So the luminosity, for instance, of a star, yeah, we know is a 4 times pi r square, where r is the radius of the star, so it's the surface of the, of the sphere, multiplied by the flux at the stellar surface. Yeah? Well, it's also equal yeah, to 4 pi z square. This is the distance between the star and the observer. Yeah? So it's a sphere at the observer's distance, measure, uh, multiplied by the apparent flux of the star. Yeah? So now, if you just divide r square by z square, you find that it is equal to small f over big F. Yeah? And so you have that relation. So the flux at the surface of the star is the apparent flux measured on Earth divided by the angular diameter of the star. Now we know uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law, which states that well, the flux at the stellar surface yeah, is a constant, yeah, Stefan Boltzmann constant, multiplied by the power 4 of the effective temperature. Yeah? So from that relation, you replace big F yeah, by this one, and you may extract the effective temperature as being a quantity yeah, uh, that you may derive if you know the apparent flux of the star on Earth divided by the square of the angular diameter. Yeah? And this is kind of magical. Yeah? So let's measure the flux of the sun on Earth. Let's divide by the angular diameter, which is 1 over 114. Yeah? And we get the te effective temperature, something like of the order 6,000 degree Kelvin. Yeah? So, well, I find this fascinating, yeah? no, right? That without uh, touching the star, yeah, you may get an estimate of its effective temperature. Yeah? Of course, now, if you know the distance, well, you, you succeed in measuring the angular diameter of the star, and if you know the distance, yeah, you may derive the linear radius of the star. Yeah? OK, so now just a few reminders that the France already presented yeah, uh, two days ago. So here I assume that I have the representation. You have uh, the electric field, so not, not the magnetic field, but the electric field polarized of a monochromatic wave as a function of time. So I'm at a part particular location, yeah? and I just see how the electric field oscillates. Yeah? So it's sinusoid. Yeah? And I know that the period is defined yeah, as a time interval between uh, two crests, and also equal to 1 over nu. Now, well, this is the representation of the electric field yeah? as a function of the, well, time coordinate, but also, oh no, sorry, as a function of the spatial coordinate. Yeah? Because now I could say, well, I may freeze yeah, the time and look as a function of the distance how the electric field yeah, is varying. So I'm just taking a well, picture of the electric field. And what I see well, is that um, the distance between two crests yeah, is what is called the wavelength, right? And I know that the wavelength yeah, is just the period times the velocity of light, or since the period is 1 over nu, yeah, we have that relation. 
Now, as Franz has shown, yeah, well, it's very convenient yeah, to represent uh, in a complex, uh, with a complex exponential, uh, the electric field. So, the electric field becomes the real part yeah, of this expression because, well, it's uh, easy to separate yeah, the time and the space coordinate. Yeah? Indeed, you may rewrite this expression as follows. Yeah? And now, if you consider this product, the product of the real amplitude yeah, and this uh, phase factor, we get wh what is known as a complex amplitude of the electric field. Yeah? And uh, it's very convenient yeah, to represent the electric field as being the product of the complex amplitude by uh, this uh, time function, yeah? Okay, and, uh, well, as Franz said, yeah, well, the frequency of the vibration is so high that it's impossible to measure, so what we are interested in, yeah, is just the intensity, which is the uh, average over a long period of time, yeah, of the square of the electric field. And you, if you replace the E square, yeah, by the previous expression of the electric field, what you find is that the intensity yeah, is equal to the square of the real amplitude or the square of the module of the complex amplitude or the complex amplitude times its conjugate. Yeah? Okay? So we'll make uh, very much use of that expression, of that result. Yeah? So this is just a reminder. And of course, I mean, uh, well, what is at the basis yeah, of uh, the image formation is, of course, against Fresnel principle, yeah, according to which yeah, the front, front wave yeah, may be considered as an infinity of small sources yeah, which are all vibrating in phase yeah, and emitting uh, concentric spherical waves. And after a certain time, if you'd like to know what, where is the wave front, yeah, you just take the envelope yeah, of all these spherical wavelets yeah, and you, you, you understand how the, the wave propagates. Well, if uh, Initially, uh, the front wave is spherical, yeah, where you consider also a series of uh, secondary sources emitting concentric waves. You take the envelope and you recover still a spherical wave propagating with the speed of light. Now we know that because, um, so, <clears throat> well, Fresnel just added that, well, uh, you have to, to, to consider yeah, the um, interference between these uh, wavelets. Yeah, no. So if two wavelets yeah, oscillate uh, in phase, yeah, their amplitude yeah, is just the summation of the two amplitudes. If they are just in, opposite, in phase opposition, then the net amplitude is zero. And uh, well, this is the way yeah, you may understand why when uh, a front wave uh, falling on an aperture, yeah, converging aperture, yeah, doesn't give rise yeah, to a Dirac spot of light, yeah, but uh, to um, the famous airy disk. And we will see in a moment yeah, how we may analytically yeah, find the expression of that airy disk. Yeah. But I remind you that the angular width, so the distance between the two first minima, yeah, is 2.44 for lambda over d in radians. Yeah. OK, well, I just pass this one. I, I, I shall assume yeah, that uh, there is no atmosphere or that we correct it yeah, with an adaptive optic system. And now I just come to the first experiment that you will make. Yeah? Well, in a moment. Yeah? So I will distribute yeah, to each of you a small envelope. So there is a needle. So be careful yeah? uh, with a the needle. Then inside there is uh, just a uh, cartoon, fold it in two pieces, and we shall try first yeah, to construct yeah, a single aperture hole. Yeah. So you just need uh, to take the needle to make a very small hole, if possible half a millimeter in diameter, and as circular as possible. Yeah. Now, well, the first time I saw that experiment was probably around 1990. It was Michel Fauchard who it to me, and uh, well, I find it magnificent. So you will be able, yeah. Well, after you make a hole, I will switch on the lights, and you will see whether you see the airy disk, yeah, in white light. If yes, if it's good, then there will be some glue, and you will glue that aluminium, yeah, inside. 
And this would be your mask, yeah? And see the airy disk for the first aperture. Yeah? So I will distribute them in a moment, but I'll go, uh, I'll go on now. Now, if, if the hole is not very well down, yeah, just make a second one yeah, on the side. Try again. If it doesn't work, make a third hole. Yeah, well, on the average, you, know, you need to make about five holes before one properly works. Yeah? And there are a few pieces of aluminum, but just uh, keep one yeah, for the second experiment yeah, that I'll describe in a moment. Now, about the history of solar diameter measurements. Yeah? So, well, the pupil of our eye yeah, typically has a diameter that varies between one millimeter and five millimeter. Okay? Now, well, using uh, the magical formula that Franz gave you a few days ago, you remember? Uh, if I remember well, uh, I think uh, the diameter of the airy disk in milli arc second, right? So, in a milli arc second, is equal to 200 times the wavelengths, wavelengths in micron, yeah, correct, divided by the diameter in meter. Okay, so it would be interesting to know, yeah, what is about the angular resolution of our eye, yeah? So, for the wavelength, let's take a 5,000 angstrom, this is half a micron, yeah? So this, is, this becomes 100 divided by the diameter in, millime, in meter, and uh, one millimeter is 10 to the minus three yeah, meter, correct? So I have to multiply this by 10 to the three, and I find that it's about 10 to the five milli arc second, or 10 to the two arc second, so 100 arc second, so it's about between uh, one and two arc minutes, correct? For one millimeter, yeah? So if you take, well, I, I guess in the darkness, yeah, your pupil is a bit bigger, yeah? So your angular resolution may go down to half a half minute, something like that, yeah? So before Galileo, yeah, most of the people thought that the diameter of the stars, yeah, was about one, two arc minutes. Now, if I ask you why, do you know why? It's easy. I gave the answer before. Because, well, it is angular resolution of our eye, yeah? And so most of the people thought that the angular diameter of the stars yeah, was of that order. Now, Galileo made the following very interesting experiment, yeah? Just took a wire, yeah, very, very thin wire, and, <coughs> well, it will come again, yeah? He set his eye behind the wire while looking at the Vega so that the wire would occult, yeah? The image of Vega. So we had to go yeah, at a certain distance. Well, if you go too far away, yeah, it doesn't occult the star. If you come very close, yeah, it will occult the star. And so he measured yeah, the diameter of the wire and divided it by the distance between the wire and its high. And he found about five seconds of arc. Yeah, five seconds of arc. So that was already a big improvement yeah, for the angular diameter of a star. So does any, except Roma, does anyone know why five seconds of arc? We're seeing a little bit about atmospheric turbulence. We are below an atmosphere, okay? And yeah, the angular diameter of the star, yeah, is not its real diameter, but it's affected by the turbulence, yeah? So what he was measuring, in fact, yeah, was uh, atmospheric turbulence, yeah? Okay, but okay, it's already a, a nice improvement. Yeah, then comes Newton. Yeah, and uh, well, Newton. Yeah, well, I find it uh, very nice. Yeah, English spiritual spirituality. You know, like uh, you know the song "The Fool of the on the Hill." Yeah, so the the song says something like that, and the fool on the hill will close his eye in his mind. Well, no, in the fool on the hill. Well, see the world spinning around and the highs in his... No, 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 I don't see. I think the fool on the hill sees the sun going down and the highs in his mind see the world spinning around, yeah? And well, this is sort of that approach by Newton. What Newton does, yeah? Well, it's very nice.
So, yeah. You just say, okay, the magnitude of the sun minus the magnitude of vega is equal to minus 2.5 times the logarithm of the flux of the sun. Yeah? So it is the luminosity of the sun divided by 4 pi, the distance between the earth and the sun, yeah? and divided by the flux of vega. But you say, well, do you think that uh, vega is a, a star like the sun? Yeah? So you divide by the flux of vega, which is L divided by z square, where z is the distance of vega. So you see, you have nice simplification, LL, 4 pi, 4 pi. Yeah? And now, what you do, in addition to that, yeah? well, I take this. You multiply above and below by r square, where r is a solar radius. Now, you may write this that the apparent magnitude of the sun is about minus 26.7, minus the magnitude of vega, zero, is equal to minus 2.5 times the logarithm of, now, the radius of the sun divided by the square of the distance to the sun yeah, is the square of the angular radius of the sun. Yeah? So this is about uh, 1 divided by 114 radian. Yeah? And now divided by the angular radius of vega, because it is the radius yeah, of vega or of the sun divided by the square of the distance to vega from the Earth. Yeah? And you see from this relation, you may extract yeah, the angular radius that probably uh, vega s compared to the angular radius of the sun. So the angular radius of the sun we know. We know this quantity, so you may find out that the angular radius, well, here I just plotted the angular diameter that Newton derived was 2 milli arc second. Yeah? Yeah, so very nice. Yeah, this is fantastic. So Newton already had a very good idea about, yeah, what was the angular diameter of a star, yeah? Of the order of the mini arc second, yeah? I think if you make <coughs> correctly the calculation today with the um, apparent magnitude of the sun that we know, yeah? You would find uh, eight mini arc second, yeah? But that was very nice. Now comes the uh, FISO type interferometry. And I just want to remember you about the uh, Young's double hole experiment, yeah? So this is an experiment that I think all of you yeah, have seen during high school studies. Yeah? So you take a screen with two holes, yeah? and you look at a very distant star, and you look on a screen at the back, yeah? what happens? And we know that we will see fringes. Yeah? Fringes, yeah? black and white, black and white, black and white. Yeah? When I say black, it means the intensity zero. Yeah? in white, full light, etc. And that's the interfringe, so the angular distance yeah, between two fringes. Yeah? Well, when you make a well, calculation, it's very simple. Yeah? Uh, you could say, OK, let's determine yeah, the x and y, z position here on the screen, such that the distance between P1 and P minus the distance between P2 and P is equal to one wavelength. Yeah, because then we know that the two waves will oscillate yeah, in phase. Yeah? And this is very simple to do. And you would find that the angular distance between uh, two maxima yeah, is equal to lambda over b. So this is for the case of a monochromatic light uh, and a distant source. So FISO, yeah? We well, thought about a very interesting experiment shown on the next screen, next slide, which is the following. So here is represented the pupil of a telescope. Yeah? So for him, it was an 80 centimeter <coughs> diameter telescope of Marseille. Yeah? And above which, yeah, you just set a screen. And this, you can make the, the exper experiment at home, yeah? even with a camera, photographic camera like that, or you take a small telescope, yeah, five centimeter in diameter, 
you just put yeah, in front of your telescope a small screen yeah, with two little holes, yeah, uh, which could be uh, okay, uh, a few millimeters of diameter separated by a few millimeters. And look at bright star with it, yeah? and you will see a very interesting thing. Okay, now let's assume that we are, so this is a pupil, this is a screen, and there are two holes. Yeah? Now let's assume that I block yeah, this second hole and let the light of the star pass through the first hole. What shall I see in the focal plane? Yeah, what shall I see? Collusion. What? Collusion. Uh, so the star is font-like. It's font-like, yeah? So, I have a very small hole, yeah? But a converging system behind, yeah? So that I may look in the focal plane, yeah? And I see something, yeah? What shall I see for just one hole? I will see every disk, okay. Does everybody agree with that? But the every disk of what? Of? of the whole, of course, yeah, of the whole. So what you will see here yeah, is a, well, rather big hairy disk because the hole is very small. Yeah? Now let's assume that I block the first hole and I let the light passing through the second hole. What I see, exactly the same, yeah? hairy disk of the second hole. And the two holes are superposing yeah, each other, b between each other, but in addition, yeah, I know from Young's experiment yeah, that I will see fringes. Yeah? And the fringes yeah, so will be like this, white and black, with an angular separation of lambda over b, where b is a distance between the two holes. Yeah? Okay? Yeah? So this is very simple. Now, let's assume that I take this experiment and look at a double star. Yeah? If the two stars, well, so this, this is the airy disk uh, with the fringes, yeah? So this is maxima, minima here, yeah? So if I look at two distant stars, yeah, of course I see, yeah, two airy disks with fringes. Is the star get closer, closer? Okay. Now let's assume that the stars are so close that they are unresolved, yeah? So I will just see, yeah, airy disk with fringes like that. But now just assume that the star the second star, which is equally bright to the first one, has a maxima going in the minima of the first one. Yeah? What will happen? Yeah? You, see? you see that the fringes will disappear. You won't see fringes anymore. Yeah? This is a basic idea that uh, Fizeau proposed, yeah? is to use an interferometer yeah? to try to resolve yeah, stars. And you resolve the stars yeah, when the baseline is large enough that the fringes yeah, of uh, well, an element of the star, or in case of a double star, yeah, one of the two, yeah, show a pattern of fringes of maxima going in the minima of the second one. Yeah. So you see, in that case, the uh, visibility of the fringes yeah, is zero. Okay? Now, so you will be able yeah, to resolve two stars separated by an angular radius, which is where the angular distance between a minimum and a maximum. And we know that the interfringe is lambda over b, so this will happen when the angular separation of the two star is lambda over 2b. Yeah? You divide by 2. Yeah? And uh, well, this is a very nice, very nice result. Yeah? Now, well, you heard a lot about visibility, so I remind you that visibility is defined as a maximum intensity minus minimum intensity of the fringes that you see divided by the summation of the two, yeah? Okay, now let's assume that I have a single star, so I see a pattern of fringes, yeah? What is the visibility? What is I mean? What is the value of I mean in that case? Zero. So visibility is I max divided by I max is equal to one, yeah? Now, if I resolve the star, yeah? So second star comes well, the maxima comes into the minima of the first one, yeah? Well, I max equal I mean, yeah? So I max minus I mean is equal zero, so visibility is zero. So we see that visibility yeah, will be some, somewhere between uh, zero and one. 
And there will be the intermediate cases yeah, when the visibility is not zero, neither one. And we would like to know, well, what kind of physical information it contains. Yeah, yeah? Do, does it contain anything? Yeah? And uh, well, the miracle is that, yes, it contains very interesting information about the star. Now, you need to relax, yeah, because too many equations already. Yeah? So I propose a second experiment. So you try first to make the first experiment with a hole, a single hole. Yeah? Then you will glue it, so you have your interferometer. After, you take the second piece of aluminum, and you will try to make two holes having a diameter of half a micron, uh, half a millimeter, sorry, half a millimeter, separated by one millimeter. Okay? And the two holes should be about the same. Yeah? So here you will probably need 10 trials before you get a good one. Yeah? And when you get the good one, you glue it, then you show it to me, and then I will give you a note between uh, visibility between 0 and 1. Okay? So 0 is very bad, yeah? and 1 uh, is fantastic. Yeah. So, I can ask you to distribute. Déjà, d'un côté, moi, je vais de l'autre. It can be very uh, funny yeah, to do, but for that, we will need a much more time, yeah, is to determine yeah, the angular diameter of the source here. Yeah? So what you would do with your interferometer, well, you would go at a very distance, uh, well, at a great distance, let's say 20 meters, then you would see the fringes, and then you should come closer and closer and closer, and at the moment, yeah, the fringes will disappear. Yeah? When lambda over 2 divided by b yeah, will uh, be reached and equal to the angular diameter of the source. Yeah? Okay? So well, what I'm saying just, I just come back here. So you see here that uh, the fringes yeah, of the two stars yeah, will lead to a zero visibility when the bright fringes of one star will go into the dark fringes of the other one. Yeah? And we know that this will happen when the angular diameter of the source is equal to lambda over 2b. So what in principle you should do with your interferometer, you should go well, far away from the source, look at it, then you see the fringes. And as you will go closer and closer, the angular diameter will increase, yeah? And uh, when the angular diameter will be equal to lambda over 2b, which is uh, specific yeah, to the baseline of your interferometer and to the wavelengths, white light, yeah? Uh, then you will see the disappearance of the fringes, yeah? And then you will know exactly what is the angular diameter yeah, of the source. Now, if you know what is the distance, between you and the source, you may derive what is the linear diameter of the source. Yeah? So it's exactly what astronomers do with the VLTI, with Shara, etc. Yeah? Is to apply this technique. But instead of uh, going away and closer to the star, they are changing the baseline. Yeah? But here, your baseline is fixed. Yeah? Yeah? So what you can do is just changing the distance, so the angular diameter. Okay. So, if what? Three holes. Oh, you can make, uh, you can make four holes and uh, even more holes. Then you will, it will work like the VLTI, yeah? And you will see uh, many patterns of fringes, yeah? yeah? From which you could derive uh, interesting information. So in this case, if you make a third hole that is not in the same direction, yeah. you will lose the fringes, right? You will, what? You no, you no, see. no. Because you will have two. Two directions. Yeah, but you will see two set, two set of fringes. So you would still be able to see. Or three sets set of fringes, two yeah? Sets of fringes. You will see one, two, one, three, and two, three. Three, three sets of fringes. You may try. And if you do a third one in the same direction, you will see two patterns of fringes in the same direction because you would have. Yeah, I, I will show you how to determine exactly what you should see. So. What should be the response function or the PSF yeah, of such an interferometer? Yeah? So you, you will have the tools yeah, to, to do it yourself. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So 
I just continue, yeah. So FISO, yeah, can be considered as a father of stellar interferometry. And uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, Stefan who tried with an 80 centimeter of a Marseille telescope, yeah, to resolve stars, yeah. So he looked, uh, well, so you see here the mask, yeah, consists not of two holes, but two slits so that you get more light. But, uh, well, the fringes will remain fringes, yeah. And, uh, well, their hope was to resolve, yeah, some bright stars. And uh, they looked uh, at the very bright, well, many star, bright stars, yeah. And they could not resolve anyone, so they were all, always seeing a visibility close to one, yeah. Which means that the angular diameter of the stars, yeah, was smaller than 0.16 arc second, which is a angular resolution, yeah, given by a baseline, I think, of 65 centimeter between the two slits, yeah, at optical wavelengths. So they could not resolve any star, yeah. And this is a pity, yeah, because, uh, well, that's the idea. This is an 80 centimeter Marseille telescope that they used. Here is still another view. And as you know, well, Michelson, yeah, first made use yeah, of uh, 30 centimeter telescopes, yeah? so a 30 centimeter telescope with a mask, yeah? and looked at the satellites of Jupiter, which angular size he knew was between 0.8 and 1.2 second of arc. Yeah? And he could demonstrate yeah, that the technique works because he could see the visibility zero yeah, on some of the satellites. So this was the first demonstration yeah, of uh, the interest of that technique. And later on, yeah, with uh, PEAS, 1920, well, it was during the winter of 1919, well, they put a boom yeah, on top of the 2.5 meter Mount Wilson telescope. Uh, and you see that you have here four mirrors, two inclined yeah, at 45 degrees in that direction, two 45 degrees in the other direction. And the two outer mirrors yeah, could be uh, varied in position yeah, to, to define different baselines. Yeah. And uh, as you know, well, they resolved yeah, well, alpha Orionis yeah, and uh, derived yeah, an angular diameter of 47 milli arc second. Yeah. And I think their angular resolution yeah, was about 20 milli arc second yeah, with that boom yeah, of a uh, seven meter long. Uh, well, later on, yeah, the technique was used to resolve many spectroscopic uh, binary stars by Anderson, yeah. And then uh, Michelson and Peace tried to make use of a longer boom, yeah, or beam, I don't know how you call it, yeah, but uh, well, 15 meter during many years, but due to flexure problems, vibrations, etc., yeah, it's very difficult, yeah, to to set up that experiment, and they could not uh, make use of a large, larger baselines. Yeah. Now, while well, the technique uh, was abandoned after their many efforts, and uh, it was revived after by Anbury Brown yeah, in Twist, yeah. and I shall tell a few words later on yeah, about uh, this uh, other technique known as uh, intensity interferometry. Yeah. So. I'll speak about it yeah, in a moment, just to give you the in intuitive uh, approach of that. Yeah. But uh, well, the physiotype interferometry has been uh, very, very successful yeah, at radio wavelengths because, uh, as you will see in a moment, yeah, where the constraints, yeah, technological constraints, yeah, are not so, so, so enormous yeah, at radio because uh, the wavelength is much larger than at optical wavelengths. Now, I come to a well, very important part yeah, of my presentation, which is, which is about light co coherence. Yeah? So wh what you have done now yeah, is just assuming a monochromatic wave, yeah, and the formula that I presented here yeah, were for the case of a monochromatic wavelengths. But you know, well, this means a very, very narrow band, uh, very narrow filter, narrow band filter, but then you don't get uh, much light. So the idea is really to, to take a certain width, yeah, so a small spectral range, which typically is lambda plus or minus delta lambda, this is the bandwidth, which translates yeah, in a frequency unit as nu, so this is a central frequency, plus or minus delta nu. Now, well, what will be the expression of the electric field in that case? Well, of the intensity, we know that is a time average yeah, of the 
electric field multiplied by its uh, conjugate, complex conjugate. Now, the electric field, yeah, across a band, well, spectral band of certain widths, yeah, is just integration, yeah, from nu minus delta nu to nu plus delta nu of the real intensity, yeah, multiply, yeah, by this complex expression where we see the time and space variables, yeah, well separated. And what we do here, yeah, we just integrate yeah, over the frequencies in that spectral range. Now, <clears throat> here is a trick. Yeah? Just insert in the integrand yeah, the product of these two uh, complex conjugate expressions, which product is equal to 1, yeah? and rewrite the above expression in the following form. You say, OK, the electric field yeah, may be represented as the product of that quantity multiplied by, of course, this quantity, but we change the integrand yeah, by multiplying by this expression. So this is a complex amplitude, which is equal to this expression multiplied by that one. Yeah? And what uh, one could demonstrate, and uh, I will do that, yeah, because uh, it's very neat, is that uh, the complex amplitude yeah, is an expression yeah, which varies as a function of time or as a function of the distance, yeah, but with a much, much longer period. Okay? So, just to demonstrate that, well, what we will do, yeah, we will assume that uh, the amplitude here, A of nu prime, yeah, across the bandwidth is a constant. Okay? And this is a very good approximation. So, if we do that, so now I may switch off the stars. Yeah. But during the interruption, yeah, if you'd like to try to determine yeah, the angular diameter of um, these sources, yeah, you may come and play around. So I just switch off the lights. Here and here. Okay, so let, let's assume here that the real amplitude here is a constant, yeah? So the complex amplitude, yeah, A, which depends on ZT, will be equal to, do you see or not? Not very well. In fact, I think that we would need some light on the screen. Wait, wait. <laughs> Is it better now? Yeah. yeah. So, A Z T is equal to A nu prime, which is a constant. I will call it A zero. Yeah. Multiply by I integrate between nu minus delta nu to nu plus delta nu. Now, I assume yes yeah, that uh, I just uh, place myself at the position z equal to zero. Yeah. So this just drops. Yeah? It's easier. So, what remains is just the exponentiation of i to pi nu prime minus nu t d nu prime. Well, we we could keep that factor, yeah, and replace the lambda as c over nu, but it won't change very much. Now I just make a change of variable yeah, in that expression, yeah. I just defined uh, z as being i to pi nu prime minus nu times t, so that dz will be equal to i to pi t d nu prime, correct? So this quantity transforms into the following. So I replace here by z, where nu prime is equal to this uh, limit, yeah? So it would be i to pi uh, minus delta nu times t, 
and here it will be high to pi delta nu t. Now exponentiation of z multiplied by the d nu prime, which is dz, divided by i to pi t. Now this is very easy huh, to calculate, to evaluate. It will be a0 multiplied by exponentiation of complex exponentiation of i to pi delta nu t minus exponentiation of minus i to pi delta nu t divided by i to pi t. Okay, now exponentiation of i z minus exponentiation of minus i z to be two times i times the sine. Yeah? So the two i will go away there, so it will be sine of two pi delta nu times t divided by pi times t. Now I could uh, divide by delta nu and here multiply by delta nu. Okay. And what I see, I get, I'm getting now a function yeah, which shows that the complex amplitude yeah, varies still with time, yeah, but with a much longer period because uh, the period yeah, where it's known as a time of coherence is equal to 1 over delta nu. So the frequency is not anymore nu, but it's delta nu. Yeah? So if delta nu yeah, is small, well, the time, so-called time of coherence, yeah, will be long. Now, well, intuitively, yeah, what uh, it does represent? Well, here I have represented yeah, as a function of time, yeah, well, different uh, train of waves, which frequency nu prime yeah, is about equal to nu. Yeah? And now, of course, it will combine yeah, between each other, and they will lead yeah, to a train of waves, yeah, which frequency, yeah? So the frequency yeah, will still be new here, but the amplitude yeah, will vary as a function of time, but with a much larger period, yeah? And this is what you see. It, it, it leads yeah, to a beat phenomenon, yeah? It's a beat phenomenon, and the period of beat yeah, is so-called the time of coherence, yeah? It's one over delta nu. Now we could have uh, done the, the other way around. Yeah? I could have said here, well, let's assume now that I freeze the time, t equals zero, and I just look yeah, as a function of the distance how the train waves behave. Yeah? And what we, we, what we would find is exactly the same. Yeah? Same result, but this time we would find that, uh, okay, the distance between two peaks is lambda, again, lambda equals c over nu, but that the period of the beat phenomenon yeah, is a so-called uh, uh, length of coherence, yeah? the coherence length, which is uh, what? Well, it's written here, but I will show you how to, to derive it yeah, from the previous result. It's the square of the wavelength divided by delta lambda. Yeah? So typically, we know that oops. so we know that well that length that I would call uh, well effective length, so this, this doesn't work. or the length of coherence, small l, yeah, should be equal to c multiplied by the time of coherence. Yeah? So it should be equal to c over delta nu. Now I know that nu is equal to c over lambda. So delta nu is equal to minus c over lambda square times delta lambda. And if, if I replace, yeah, well, well, making abstraction of the minus sign, delta nu in that expression, I find that it is c divided by delta nu, which is, uh, this is c, huh? c multiplied by delta lambda 
multiply by lambda square, cc goes away, I find that it is lambda square over delta lambda. This is a so-called length of coherence. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so why... why well, first, uh, an illustration here well, is represented as a bit phenomenon yeah, for radiation being emitted in the spectral range between 2.07 micron up to 2.33 micron. Yeah? I think these data were collected with Humber, yeah, the VLTI. So the central, central wavelength is 2.2 micron. So the bandwidth yeah, is uh, 0.13 because uh, if you subtract from 33.7, you find 26 divided by 2. It's 13. Yeah? And, okay, now we, we should like to see if it's correct. Yeah? From that expression, <coughs> I take the yellow, uh, not the green. So this is uh, the so-called uh, co coherence length. Yeah? Well, I find that... Uh, no, no, no. This is a co coherence length. So from that expression, I find that divided by lambda is equal to lambda over delta lambda. Lambda is 2.2. Uh, 2.2 divided by delta lambda is 0.13. So if you make the division, yeah, 2.2 by 0.13, you find something of the order of 17. 17, yeah? And now, if I count the number of uh, cries that I have here, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah? So you find that, indeed, the coherence length is 17 times larger than the wavelength, okay? So it works. Now here, what I represented yeah, is a quasi-monochromatic light, so emitted in a narrow bandwidth, coming from an unresolved star. So it's a plane wave yeah, falling on two apertures, which are represented here, and separated by a baseline equal to B. Yeah? So what I shall do yeah, with my two telescopes, I will just adjust the delay lines yeah, to make sure that well, I may recombine in a coherent way yeah, the two trains of waves coming from telescope one with those of telescope two. This is possible, yeah? no, no problem. Okay, this is a case of an unresolved star. Now, if the star is resolved, yeah, what will happen? Look, if the star is resolved, it means that we also receive yeah, light from the star yeah, from another direction. Yeah? Now, here I have represented the, oh, sorry, the light rays, yeah, parallel. Now, the wave front yeah, is perpendicular to the light rays. In here, I represented, you know, this package of uh, quasi-monochromatic lights. And here, the problem is that when uh, these waves will reach telescope one, those have not yet reached telescope two. So, if I want to recombine them yeah, in a coherent way, I should make sure that the path length difference, P, is much smaller than the coherence length. Okay? So this is a necessity. Otherwise, it, it won't work. So it means, so just look here, this is interesting, that uh, the angle theta here is exactly the same as that one. So this is the angular width of the source yeah, between the two directions. So I see that this direction is perpendicular yeah, to that one, and this other direction is indeed perpendicular to that one. So this angle is the same. So I have the condition that P should be smaller than the coherence length. Now the sine of theta, well, it's so small that I may assimilate it yeah, to theta, but the sine of theta is P divided by B, okay? From which I deduce that B times theta should be much smaller than lambda f, okay? Which translates yeah, in the units of France as follows. The baseline in meter should be smaller than 200 times the effective or the coherence length in microns divided by the size of the source in mini arc second, yeah? So let's assume that you have a source 
which angular diameter is a one milli arc second. Now that you observe it one, mi one micron, it means that you should yeah, have a baseline which is smaller than 200 meters. Okay? Otherwise, if uh, the baseline yeah, is, let's say, one kilometer, you won't be able yeah, to coherently yeah, uh, recombine the lights from the two telescopes. Yeah? Now, if you said, this is amazing too, if you take the case of the sun, yeah, well, the sun is an angular diameter, I said, of 1 over 114 milli arc second, yeah, uh, region, which in, in milli arc second would be 1,000 times 60 times 60, yeah, so how, or, or times 30, half a degree you would find that the baseline here should be 76 microns. So to, to see interference yeah, of the light on the sun, yeah, you need yeah, to have very small holes, something like 10, 10 or 20 microns, with a baseline smaller than 70 microns. Yeah? And well, for fun, yeah, well, we have produced such a mask, yeah, well, which represent uh, the different types of interferometer that exist. So the VLTI, Shara, uh, Ovla, Carlina, Keops, yeah? And uh, on this plate, yeah, we have 49 micro interferometers, yeah? Uh, with the holes typically of, uh, I think, 7.5 and 15 microns. And when there is a sun, and you look with that, well, the sun with that, yeah, you see a very, very nice uh, point spread function of all those interferometers, yeah? And well, we are making uh, in Liège, yeah, some experiment with the students, yeah, using uh, this kind of mask, yeah? But I'll come to that in a moment. Okay, now, we've seen that if, in the Young's experiment, if you have a screen with two holes, it's what you did, in a light source, yeah, which is point light, you get here, dark and bright fringes, yeah? Now we could wonder, well, and for the case yeah, of quasi-monochromatic light, so not monochromatic, and a source yeah, having a finite dimension, yeah? What would you observe there, yeah? Well, we already know what we should observe. If the star is unresolved, it's uh, fringes uh, with a visibility of one. If the star yeah, is being resolved, it would be visibility zero. If the star is in between, yeah, it will be something more complex. And, well, very, very rapidly, I will show you uh, how to make a demonstration and find a, well, a nice result. Yeah? Well, I do it rather quickly, yeah? but if you would like to see uh, more details, you just go on uh, the video from the Barcelona School. There's a demonstration. Yeah? He's made, he's made a, a, a more in details. Yeah? So it's okay. I'm interested. Yeah? to see what is the distribution of intensity in this screen. So I know that it is a time average yeah, of the electric field multiplied by its conjugate. So the time average. And here I say, okay, the electric field yeah, at Q, at a given point Q in the screen, is of course yeah, the electric field yeah, uh, coming from uh, P1, but not at the time t, but at the time t minus the propagation time it takes for the light to go from hole one to the point Q, okay? Plus the electric field, yeah, evaluated here, but corrected, yeah, for the time it takes to go from hole two to the point Q. Okay, now what, what I do, yeah, I change uh, the, the time on my, on my clock, watch, yeah? I just add a uh, plus T1Q here, plus T1Q here, and VQT, I say, okay, it's uh, V1T plus V2 T minus 2. It doesn't matter. I just change, uh, you know, the time on my watch arbitrarily. And I define a tau as being the difference between uh, these two propagation time. Yeah? Now what you do next, yeah, you just insert that result in that expression. Yeah? And then you will see, you see that you will have uh, four products, yeah? Well, one product will be... Uh, V1 times V1 star, yeah? And uh, this is just uh, the intensity due to hole one. After you will, you will have V2 times V2 star, 
well, this will be time average and the intensity due to the hole number two. Now, I assume that my two holes are similar, okay? So, high one equal high two. So, I have a nice interferometer. And then, I, 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 I left the byproduct uh, like V1 star times V2 T minus tau plus V1 times V2 star T minus two. So, the result is given here. I find that the intensity will be the intensity due to hole one plus intensity due to two, to hole two plus two high times the real part yeah, of the quantity which is called the complex degree of mutual coherence. Okay? And well France yeah, has shown its expression. And here, well, you could yeah, at home yeah, really repeat the demonstration. Yeah? It's really not difficult. Yeah? Yeah? And I really invite you to do it. Yeah? Now, what we do, we replace now the yes, expression of the electric field here, V1, by the product of its complex amplitude by an exponential, well, complex factor, yeah, uh, where intervenes the time variable. And if you do that, yeah, well, you find that the expression of gamma 1, 2 leads to that result. And now it's here that we make um, an approximation, yeah, which is very important, yeah, otherwise, you, you have no more. The value of tau here is much less than the time of co coherence. Okay? So, 1 over delta nu, you, you remember, is a period of the bit phenomenon. Yeah? So, we assume that the difference between the propagation time between hole 1, 2 and the point Q is much smaller than that. Yeah? And in that case, yeah, it's possible to represent this expression. Yeah? Well, using cylindric coordinates in the complex plane yeah, as a module of this quantity times this factor. Yeah? Now you take this expression, replace it in that one, take the real part, because this is a module so it's real, and the real part of that is a cosine. Yeah? Now let's do that. So we find here the module of gamma 1, 2, 0, and here is the cosine. Yeah? And now we may try to see, using this expression, yeah, what the visibility becomes. Yeah? So we, may, we must make I max minus I min divided by I max plus I min. Now, I max yeah, is this expression when the cosine is equal to plus 1. Okay? The I min is that expression when cosine is equal to minus 1. Yeah? So I max is I plus I plus 2 high times gamma 1, 2, 0. And high mean is i i minus 2 high times gamma 1 to 0. So we can make this simple calculation here. Yeah. So we find that the visibility yeah, is equal to i max. So it's 1 minus module of gamma 1 to 0. Okay, now the two high, yeah? simplify, very nice. One minus one zero, gamma one two minus gamma uh, minus minus gamma one two will be twice module of gamma one two zero divided by so one plus one two, and this minus that zero divided by two. So I find that this is equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual co coherence. Yeah? And this is very nice. Yeah? So we find that when uh, we are looking with our microinterferometer yeah, at a distant source, where we see fringes, yeah, but with a certain contrast. Yeah? And the visibility yeah, is directly related yeah, to the complex degree of coherence of uh, the electric field yeah, at uh, two different points in space. Yeah? OK, now, well, I don't know what time is it. 20 past 10. Uh, well, coffee is there already, yeah? So I think uh, probably, yeah, it will be a, it's a good time yeah, to make a break, yeah? And uh, the next step will be uh, to wonder, well, but the complex degree of mutual coherence, uh, is it uh, related to the source, yeah? And you will see there is a fantastic result, you know? Nature is miraculous, yeah? Well, thanks to Fourier, of course, yeah? As you'll see, after coffee. So make, let's make the break now. Yeah. yeah. 
So just a small summary of the main results. Yeah? So the angular radius of a star is a linear radius divided by the distance. And it's possible to infer the effective temperature of stars yeah, by just measuring the apparent flux of the star and its angular radius. Now, the electric field yeah, has been represented yeah, well, for case of a monochromatic wave yeah, by the following expression. And for a quasi-monochromatic light yeah, by this expression where the amplitude is a function of t, varies as a function of time but with a period which is much larger than, than the period of the, of the light. Yeah? Now the time of coherence, we have seen that it's one of our delta nu. Our delta nu is the bandwidth through which we are looking at. And the length of coherence yeah, is a lambda square over our delta lambda. Now, well, for uh, Michelson and Pease yeah, to make their experience yeah, uh, possible, they had to make sure that the difference of lengths yeah, coming from the star and going through the two small mirrors, then being recombined yeah, at the focal plane, yeah, that the difference between the two path lengths was smaller than this coherence length. So if you set here yeah, uh, 5,000 angstrom and you divide by 1,000, you find that it is about 2.5 microns. Yeah? So this was... Uh, requirement, yeah? so technological requirement, yeah? and it's very difficult to achieve, of course, 2.5 micron, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah? exactly. Yeah. Okay, intensity yeah, is a square of the module of the complex amplitude of the electric field. Then we've seen that the, in the experiment of FISO, yeah, the fringe would disappear whenever the angular diameter of the source yeah, is bigger than lambda over 2b, where lambda is the wavelength, and b, uh, wavelength of the monochromatic light, uh, quasi-monochromatic, so it's the central wavelength yeah, of the bandwidth, it's the bandwidth, and b is the baseline. Yeah. Now we have seen that, well, the fringes that we will observe in the vocal plane is given by that expression, where gamma 1, 2, 0 yeah, is a complex degree of mutual coherence of light. And this value may vary between 0 and 1, zero when you resolve the star, and one when it is unresolved, and in between, well, we may wonder. Now the complex degree of mutual coherence was defined as such, yeah? and fringe visibility yeah, was equal to this quantity. So now we may wonder, yeah? well, what does it represent? Yeah? What does represent the complex degree of mutual co coherence? Well, let, let's look at the expression. Yeah? Well, the complex degree of mutual coherence is a time average of V1 conjugate complex by V2 divided by the intensity, assuming that two holes yeah, have, are similar, yeah, the same aperture. Yeah. So, okay, we, we should evaluate what, the, what is the expression of V1t and V2t, then inject it in this expression and make the calculation. Yeah. So, well, the source, yeah, well, as the friend said, yeah, is represented, yeah, by small source elements, which are emitting in an incoherent way, yeah. And uh, this is a projection on the plane of the sky. Uh, S is a surface being projected, and DSI are small surface elements, yeah. <coughs> so, we may write, yeah, the expression of a V1 is follow, is follow. It is a summation, yeah, of the contribution of all these small surface elements, yeah. Uh, at point one, yeah, so it's a summation from i equal one to n. Well, at point two, yeah, is a summation, yeah, of uh, all the contribution of these source elements yeah, at the point two. Now you inject, yeah, v1 into that expression, v2, and you find that you have many cross products, yeah. So what you get is that this expression is equal to the summation of time average of vi1 star. So conjugate complex times v, vi2. Then summation on i, different from j, of vi1 times vg2. And this is a conjugate complex. Now, because where well, these are incoherent source elements emitting yeah, on the average, yeah, this quantity will be equal to 0. OK, this is 0. So this is what remains. Yeah? And now we will replace yeah, the expression of vi1 and vi2 by 
the expression involving the complex amplitude of the electric field yeah, and its time dependence. So, okay, let's do that. So, the expression of the electric field yeah, of source element i at point i at point 1 is just the complex amplitude yeah, ai corrected for the time it takes to the light to come from the source element i to the to the point P1, okay? So this is a time correction. Now we divide it because of the dilution yeah, of the electric field, yeah? And this is the time and uh, where space dependence, same for VI2. So we replace these two expressions by this. Now what we obtain yeah, is that uh, <coughs> We have this complex amplitude times the conjugate com or this conjugate complex amplitude times this one, and you see we are represented by module square y. We can do that, yeah, if the difference in distance yeah between r i one and r i two is smaller than the coherence length. Yeah, so this is ver very important. Yeah, if the module of the difference between these two distances yeah, is smaller than that. We can just make the cross product yeah, and find the square of the amplitude because, as I said before, yeah, the, the beat phenomenon yeah, is a very low frequency yeah, where distance dependence or time dependence. Yeah, and if this uh, difference in distance yeah, is smaller than the coherence of length, yeah, you may assume that well, the amplitude here or the amplitude there yeah, is about the same and we can make uh, this approximation. Yeah? So well, what one needs to do that demonstration at home yeah? and, uh, to really uh, uh, understand every step. Yeah? Okay, now, here we see that when we take the conjugate complex of this quantity multiplied by this one, where well, the time dependence goes away. And what remains is just here, Ri1 minus Ri2 minus Ri1. And this we will need to evaluate very, very accurately. Yeah? Now here, you see we divide by Ri1 and Ri2. If you take this one square or that square, it's the same. There's no importance. Yeah? Just think a little bit about it. Yeah? Just to say that the dilution of the electric field, yeah? well, it doesn't make any difference if you divide by the square of one or, or the other. So we replace this expression in that one. Then we take also take into account the fact that the square of the complex amplitude, yeah, the source element i, yeah, is just well, it's a surface element times the intensity, and you replace the summation on all the source element by an integration, yeah, in two dimension, on the plane of the sky. And this is what uh, well, Franz showed us two days ago is the theorem of Czernikov and Sita, yeah, and as he, as yes point it out, yeah? you may still simplify this approximation yeah? in the case of the Fraunhofer approximation, which is to assume that the source extent or the distance between your two telescopes is very small compared to the distance between the interferometer and the source. And you are in that case of, well, in that approximation case. Yeah? Now, well, as I will show you, so the critical point now is to evaluate uh, this difference. Well, here I, I just give you the trick to do it, yeah? But I won't do it now because, well, it, it's very simple. So you just say, okay, R2 minus R1 is, of course, P2 P high minus P1 P high. Now you have the coordinate X, Y, 0 here, X, Y, Z prime here. And so the distance is a square root of the summation of the square of the difference in coordinates. Yeah? So x minus x prime square plus y minus y prime square plus z prime square. Then you just divide everything by z square. And you develop yeah, to the first order yeah, in a Taylor series. And the result is very simple. Yeah? Oops. You, you find that the difference in distance between, so the difference between those two distances yeah, can be expressed as follows. 
where x and y is a position yeah, of uh, the telescope yeah, P1 with respect to P2, taken as the origin, and where zeta, or I don't know how you call it, xi, how do you call it? I have difficulty. Let's, let's call it xi and eta are the angular coordinates yeah, of the source element. So, xi is just x prime divided by z prime and eta is just y prime divided by z prime. Yeah? So we see it here. So these are angular coordinates in regions. Yeah? So what we do, we take the Wernicke van Sittert yeah, result and we replace the difference between the distance in that expression. So I just show it to you where it was. So we replace this distance difference by the results we have obtained here. And here comes the result. We find that the complex degree of mutual coherence is an expression where, where you have uh, this uh, complex exponentiation yeah, outside the double integration. I is the intensity yeah, of the source element as a function of its angular coordinate, zeta and eta. Here you have uh, this, okay, divided by the double integration of the intensity over the whole surface elements. Yeah? So we can still simplify this uh, expression as follows. You see, this can be represented as I prime, which is this intensity being normalized. So it's just a normalized distribution intensity on this stellar surface. Then what, what are the parameters? Well, the variable of integration here are zeta, uh, xi, eta, xi, eta, xi, eta. So the only variables are x divided by lambda and y divided by lambda. And this is what we call yeah, the UV coordinates. Okay? So the UV coordinates yeah, are, you see, uh, <coughs> well, dimensionless. It's uh, x divided by lambda, y divided by lambda, x, y, I remember, well, I, I remind you that are the position of the telescope number two with respect to telescope number one or vice versa, yeah? Lambda is a wavelength. And uh, it's uh, space angular frequencies. Why? You remember lambda over d, yeah? Is angular resolution, yeah, of a single dish. So it is an angle. So if lambda over x yeah, is an angle, x over lambda is the inverse of an angle. Yeah? So it's a space angular frequency. Yeah. And this is a, what uh, you, 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 you heard many times about the UV plane. Yeah? The UV plane, yeah? so it's a space angular frequency plane, yeah? defined simply by the baseline between the two telescopes in one direction divided by the wavelength and the same along the perpendicular direction. Okay, so if you replace uh, x divided by lambda and y divided by lambda by uv, you find that the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, is a function of the two space angular frequencies, and that it is equal, yeah, well, to within that factor, yeah, to the Fourier transform, yeah, of the normalized distribution of the intensity over the source. Yeah? And this shows you, well, something very nice is that, well, <coughs> apart this factor, yeah, which uh, involve, uh, well, phase uh, corrections, yeah? and uh, I know that this will be addressed in the context of the radio, as, as, well, Radio interferometry, yeah? uh, you will speak about the, I forgot the name, the phase closure, phase closure, yeah. So you, you will receive the explanations, yeah, uh, in two days, uh, yeah, so I won't go into those details now because uh, we are short of time, yeah. But apart that factor, yeah, where we see that, well, the module, yeah, which is the visibility of that quantity, is equal to the module of that, so this is one. So it's the module of the Fourier transform of the distribution of normalized intensity at the surface of the star. Yeah? 
which means that, whoa, well, let's take the inverse Fourier transform of that, and what we obtain, well, we obtain that, so you multiply this quantity by that one, then you take the inverse Fourier transform, and you find that the real distribution of normalized intensity at the source yeah, is the inverse Fourier transform of the complex degree of mutual co covariance. Yeah? Which means that if you have, uh, well, many measurements yeah, of the complex degree of mutual co coherence, adopting different way, well baselines in the UV plane, yeah, you may derive yeah, the distribution of the specific normalized intensity, well, with an angular resolution, yeah, which is equal yeah, to lambda over x and lambda over y, yeah, which, is, which are the inverse of the Fourier frequencies. And uh, it means that if you have a baseline with 200 meters, yeah, you may recover yeah, angular resolution yeah, of that order in the direction uh, along the two telescopes. OK, now, uh, what, what I propose here, just a few, uh, yeah, just a few uh, reminders about the Fourier transform in one dimension. Yeah? So the Fourier transform of the function f, which depends on the variable s, yeah? is just an integration from minus infinity to infinity, fx times this. Yeah? Now, the, this function may be recovered as an inverse Fourier transform yeah? of that quantity. Well, and those uh, function exists yeah? as long as uh, this integral yeah, exists. So uh, it's not infinity. Yeah? Now, well, if you want to work yeah, in a two dimensional space, yeah, then you define a Fourier transform of a function in uh, n uh, dimensions as uh, being, uh, you see here, you multiply the two vectors, yeah? positions and uh, frequency. Is that it? Now, I just remind you about a few pro properties, linearity, so the Fourier transform of a function f multiplied by a real constant a, yeah, is a times the Fourier transform of f. The Fourier transform of the summation of two functions f and j yeah, is a sum of the Fourier transform. Then, well, this is a very nice uh, property, the similarity. The similarity, well, just make a demonstration because we will use it often, yeah? So the Fourier transform of a function, yeah, which depends on x divided by a, which is a real constant, is in fact the module of a times the Fourier transform of the function f, but evaluated now for the variable s times a. So, well, how to do that, yeah? So the Fourier transform, uh, no, I go on that blackboard for the camera. So the Fourier transform, yeah, of a function x divided by a of s equals, so just make integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function f x divided by a times exponentiation of minus i2 pi s x dx. You agree? This is the definition, yeah? So now we, we make the change of variable, yeah? y equal x divided by a. So we find that it is equal to the integration. I assume that a is positive, yeah? Okay, so this remains. So it's f of y times exponentiation of minus 2 pi s times x over a dy, so dx is dy times a, like that. In this I find that, well, it is a multiplied by, well, this is the Fourier transform of the function fx, but for the variable, oh, here I made a mistake, yeah, so x is equal to x is equal to x is equal to 
y times a. So the a yeah, comes here, so it's s times a. So here I say of the variable s times a. Okay? So you see this is a similarity uh, properties. Now translation, yeah, this is something very important too. So Fourier transform of a function f x minus a of the variable s is equal to so let's do it minus infinity to plus infinity of f x minus a time minus 2 pi x s dx. Here we make a change of variable y equal x minus a. So dy equal dx. So I see that here it will be faster. I can just put y. And here the x is equal to y plus a. So I just say, okay, this is y plus a times s. So this comes as exponentiation of minus i to pi a times s multiplied by the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity fy exponentiation minus 2 pi y s dy. And this is just equal to minus i2 pi a s multiplied by the Fourier transform. This is just the Fourier transform of a function f x or y, it's the same, yeah, which depends on the variable s. Yeah. So this that uh, is being used very, very often when you make a Fourier calculation. Therefore, I just uh, show the result. Okay, now an important, uh, well, still an important one, yeah, is this one, is a top hat function, yeah, because uh, it's being used very often. So let's do that one still, and uh, after we are finished. The Fourier transform, yeah, so the Fourier transform of the top head function, so also called the door function, yeah. Well, is equal. Now, well, I should integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, but because it is zero, outside the range, minus one half, plus one half, yeah, I just do like that. Now the value of the function in that range is one, yeah, and then I just, take the Fourier transform of 1, xs dx. Now here I just make a change of variable, y equal minus i2 pi xs. So I find that it is equal to the integration. Here it will be a, from, so divided by 2, i times pi time s, here it will be from minus i pi s of exponentiation of y. Now dx, dx is dy divided by minus i 2 pi s. This is very easy, I find it is exponentiation of minus i pi s minus e i pi s divided by minus i 2 pi s. This is easy, yeah? it's a minus 2i times the sine pi s divided by minus 2i. Yeah. So here I forgot a pi. This is a pi, yeah? pi, and divided by pi s. Nice simplification. I find that it is a sine cardinal yeah, of uh, s. In uh, intensive use of that property also. So the Fourier transform yeah, of the top hat function. Oops. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. 
the Fourier transform of the top hat function is just a sine cardinal that we found here. Okay. Let's go now to, well, in particular, yeah, if we take the Fourier transform of the door function of x divided by a, well, we've seen this is a, a similarity a property that it will be equal to the module a times the sink, but not of uh, pi s, but of pi a s. Yeah? Okay. okay, now maybe still a nice property, yeah? Well, the expression of the Dirac function can be represented as such, yeah? And the reason is the following, yeah? Let's try to take the Fourier transform of the Fourier, or of the Dirac function, yeah? So you agree that this is, this is equal to the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the Dirac function exponential minus 2 pi xs dx. And this is easy, because uh, this is just the value of the function when I integrate from minus infinity to infinity for x equals 0. So this is equal to 1. Yeah? So the Fourier transform of the Dirac function is equal to 1. So you see what is a Dirac function, yeah? yeah? And so in the Fourier space, yeah, it's just, uh, well, very nice populated frequencies and going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So now if we take the inverse Fourier transform of that, yeah, so I can say the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the Dirac function, well, this is the Dirac function, of course. Yeah? So it's equal to the inverse Fourier transform of one. So it's one times 2 pi xs dx. So this is how you find the representation yeah, of the Dirac function in terms of the Fourier expression, yeah, which is very convenient. So now, well, I have an exercise to propose. Yeah? So let's assume that we are observing, yeah, uh, well, in one dimension. Yeah? So I make things very simple. So we, we just uh, assume that the sky is a one-dimension line in that you observe a star yeah, which has a finite size. Uh, so I represent the star here. So I am looking yeah, at the sky. So this is the sky and there I have a star. And this star, yeah, is a kind of uniform, well, it's not a uniform disk, but it's a uniform line, yeah? So very simple, yeah? And now I wonder, yeah, well, let's assume that I observe with an interferometer such a star. I take the Fourier transform, yeah, I've seen that the visibility, yeah, is a module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, which, so it's a module of the Fourier transform, yeah, of that expression, yeah, so, but the intensity should be normalized, okay, so how to define it, yeah, so would you agree that the expression of that star, you could say, okay, it's the hot, well, is a top head function of xi divided by, I would say, okay, this is the angular size, yeah, of my star, C0, yeah. Here is value zero, here is value C. So I divided this, and I say this, this is the profile which represents my star. Do you agree with that or not? But is it normalized? I don't think so. To normalize it, so I say, okay, so this is the intensity as a function of C. What I need is I prime. I prime C. So what is it equal to? So what I do, I integrate, yeah? I integrate I C from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I find that, well, it's just equal to, uh, let's do it, Z, zeta uh, C zero half, one, X C. 
So this is equal to C0. Yeah. So to normalize it, I find that this, if this is equal to the top head function, what should I do now? Divide by C0. So this is a normalized intensity. Now I may apply uh, so the formula is that the visibility is equal to the module of the complex degree of coherence mutual, which is equal to the module of the Fourier transform yeah, of the normalized yeah, intensity, which is what? The store function of C divided by C0. times 1 over C0. So this is 1 over C0 multiplied by what? What is the free transform of the top head function? So it's a sink cardinal, OK? So it's OK. Uh, it is a sign of pi multiply by C0 times S divided by pi times C0. Well, here I will use U, U, the spatial frequency. Yeah. And uh, should I still multiply by something? Yes, I should still multiply by C0. Yeah. Because of the similarity property of the Fourier transform. Yeah. So, you agree? So the C0, C0 goes away. And I find that, wow, the visibility, well, is equal to the module of that, yeah? To the module, yeah? So it's a module of the sine pi C0 u divided by pi C0 u. So if I would represent yeah, the visibility, yeah? Could be something like that. When uh, u is equal to zero, yeah, this is equal to one. So I have uh, one here. This is the visibility when u, the spatial frequency, is equal to zero. Now it will get zero when this argument is equal to pi. So when u will be equal to one over c zero. So the visibility will be something like that. Yeah. Same function. Yeah. So what I should do with my interferometer, yeah, I should try to get uh, maybe uh, one point here, one point here. And then I would just fit it you know, by these squares, yeah, the visibility, and assume that, well, I'm observing a star yeah, which is a uniformly bright yeah, one-dimension source. Yeah. Uh, now, if I would see some deviations from it, yeah, well, I would say, well, this is not a good model, yeah, and I would have to try to find out the model. So, more I have measurements, yeah, better I may define, yeah, what is the real shape of my source because I'm covering the U plane in this case, one dimension, and if I have many, many measurements, yeah, I may take a inverse Fourier transform and to recover the real shape of the the source. So. If in that case, if the world was one dimension, and uh, I have many uh, measurements with uh, different baselines, so covering the U plane, yeah, I could take an inverse Fourier transform and make a aperture synthesis in one dimension. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, what, what's fantastic is that astronomers, yeah, well, have very little observing time, so they cannot afford yeah, to take many uh, uh, baseline measurements. Yeah, they, it's a finite number. So they are partially covering the UV plane, and from that, what they are doing, usually they, they just try to fit some models, yeah? But in case we would have access yeah, to more telescopes and more baselines, in principle, we could recover yeah, the real uh, normalized intensity distribution at the source and uh, with an angular resolution, as I said, yeah? Equivalent to lambda over B, where B is the value of the baseline along, yeah? A particular, particular direction. Now, well, <clears throat> now this is an exercise for one of you. Now, let's assume you. Yeah. 
So let's assume yes, that uh, I'm observing a star. And well, I have uh, many measurements. Yeah? And I find that uh, the one dimension u is equal to is uh, going that direction. And let's assume that I have a very large number of uh, measurements of visibility for different frequencies. And I find that it is a cosine, okay, cosine of, uh, I would say, okay, delta times u. The module of cosine delta times u. And if I ask uh, one of you, yeah, could you now tell me what it does represent yeah, in the source plane? Yeah? So I just give you a, a hint. I know that the intensity distribution yeah, in the source plane normalized yeah, is an inverse Fourier transform. Yeah? So it's a inverse Fourier transform by, here I will write u zeta, now du of something here, which comes from here, yeah? But here I should uh, not have, uh, so this is a module of gamma 1, 2, yeah? And here what I should write is gamma 1, 2 of u. So this was the first exercise, yeah? Well, uh, uniformly bright star in one dimension space, yeah? So it was a module of the thing, yeah? But then after you may play... Uh, now, if it would work, yeah, not in one dimension, but in two dimensions, yeah, with a circular source, yeah? You would find exactly the same result, yeah? But instead of having a thing function, you would have a first order Bessel function, yeah? So uh, it's technically a bit more difficult, but not very much, yeah? Okay, now just uh, for illustrations, this is what uh, we just found, yeah, for the case of a double star equally bright, yeah, so the visibility is a cosine function, yeah, well, the module of a cosine function. Now, if they are not equally bright, well, you see that the minimum doesn't go to zero any longer, yeah, so it goes to a finite value. But it's still possible to find the flux ratio between the two stars. Well, this is a view in two dimensions, yeah? When you, you look at uh, star, double star not resolved, you see uh, bright and dark fringes. As they are getting resolved, yeah, we see that the visibility yeah, is decreasing. Now, as I said, yeah, for a circular, well, uniformly circular, well, uniformly bright circular source, yeah, you could do exactly the same for a transform in a two-dimensional space. And the difficulty is just that, well, it's better to work there with the radial coordinates, cylindric coordinates, yeah? And just with a change of variables, yeah? Well, radial and azimuthal coordinates, yeah? You'd find that instead of having a thing function, yeah? Now it's a first-order Bessel function. In that, the zero visibility doesn't occur for lambda over b equal to the diameter, but just for uh, when this value is equal to 1.22, yeah, 1.22, yeah, okay. This is an example, yeah, of uh, real measurements made with a VLTI, I think, yeah, on uh, this, uh, on this star. And you see by fitting uh, a few visibilities, yeah, Assuming that the star is a uniformly uh, bright disk, they could measure yeah, the diameter. So it's uh, just one parameter, theta, that you need to fit uh, this function, yeah, knowing uh, the values of the baseline used for the different measurements. And uh, you, you would find that, okay, the angular diameter in that case yeah, is 16.53 mini arc second. This is again, yeah, uh, <coughs> well, the visibility sees for a double star, yeah? Oh no, it's a uniform, no, it's a uniformly, uniform disk, yeah? With different baselines, yeah? So you see uh, this is a Bessel function, yeah? And uh, we have uh, different baselines, which leads to different measurements of visibilities. This is what you see, the 
hairy disk crossed by dark and bright fringes, but the contrast decreases. So A, B, C are here, and zero, zero visibility for D. On the next slide here, we see no more fringes, zero visibility, so we are resolving the star. So the diameter of the star is 1.22 lambda over the baseline. Yeah? So very nice. Now, this is interesting. For the case of the sun, yeah? we find that the angular diameter of the sun is equal to 1.22 lambda over b, where b is the baseline. And you are wondering what should be that baseline for which, with a microinterferometer, we would see a zero visibility. Yeah? So, OK, uh, we convert. <laughs> we convert lambda 55.55 microns the baseline in, given in micron, and now the angular diameter of the sun is 30 arc minute times 60 arc second divided by the number of arc second in one region, and you remember for sure this uh, number, telephone number 206265, yeah? the most interesting number you may keep in your, in your memory. And from that I extract what should be the value of the baseline, and we find 77 micron. Yeah? Now, of course, if you make an interferometer with a baseline of a 77 micron, yeah, the whole diameter should be much smaller. Yeah? Otherwise, it would not have much sense. Yeah? So we made the micro interferometers with a diameter of 7.2 micron, 14.4 micron, and even other values. And now the first, so you see, this is just a normal camera, photographic camera. Here is a support yeah, to put the mask. Well, I have the mask here. And then we just uh, tried to take a picture. And this was, you see, the 9th of April in 2010 at Haute-Provence Observatory. We obtained uh, the fringes of the sun in white light, yeah? With a baseline of uh, 29.4 microns, and the holes were at the diameter of 11.8. So this is probably the smallest interferometer ever produced, yeah, to observe a bright star, yeah? But well, during practical work in our university, yeah, we are using this mask yeah, so that the students yeah, do exactly the same observations as uh, with a VLTI on Vega, but rather than uh, going to Chile, yeah, they can do it at home yeah, with uh, no problem with the delay lights, yeah, because we have no, not, no problems, no problem with the atmospheric thing. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So here you see the dispersion, because we work in white light. Yeah, you see, this is a, a white fringe, yeah? so all the way for, good for all wavelengths. And here we see the dispersion. Yeah? This is a blue, and this is a red. Yeah? And uh, when we see your microinterferometer, yeah? in principle, well, it's difficult, but you should also see the well, color dispersion. OK, now, well, this is an example. So we made for OVLA. Yeah? So this was a design by Antoine Laberry yeah? to distribute yeah? circular telescopes, well, telescopes on a circular ring, many of them. Yeah? So we did that. Yeah? Antoine didn't do it yet, yeah? but here I show it with a 14 micron diameter. Antoine wanted to make that with 3.6 meter yeah? diameter. Yeah? And a separation of 50 micron. And this is the observation of the sun yeah, with such a microinterferometer. Well, this, is, this are the images on the sun. Yeah. You even see clouds yeah, <laughs> that you shouldn't. This was for another configuration, like the VLA, more or less, yeah, ELSA, observing the sun. And now, well, this is just an illustration of what you can do. Yeah with a small telescope yeah, in your observatory. Yeah. And this we did with Hervé Le Corolleur at Haute-Provence Observatory in the past. Yeah. We are covering the 80 centimeter telescope with a mask yeah, and made the small holes in that, in that mask. So you see we had many masks here with uh, small holes. So we are putting this mask just here and this one on top of the telescope. And, uh, this is a series of the masks that were used. And these are the observation of Procyon, so unresolved star. Yeah? So we see uh, dark and bright fringes in the angular resolution. So the diameter of the holes were about 2 millimeters and the baseline 1.2 centimeter. 
Here it was observation of Mars, and now of Saturn. In Saturn, where we already see, but the visibility is not one and it's not zero. So, where well, the students here yeah, were processing those data to derive the angular diameter yeah, of Saturn. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's a pity that Stefan yeah, and uh, well, his associates yeah, didn't do that yeah, with their 80 centimeter telescope because it would have worked. Yeah. And uh, well, Okay, so brief summary of main results. Yeah. So visibility yeah, is a module of the complex degree of mutual coherence. Well, it's a module yeah, of the Fourier transform of the normalized distribution of intensity over the source. And we have seen that, well, by taking the inverse Fourier transform, we could recover yeah, the values of the normalized intensity distribution with an angular resolution yeah, given by lambda over, no, of B over lambda, uh, lambda over B, sorry, yeah, where B is the baseline and lambda is the the, the wavelengths, yeah? But for that, you need to cover yeah, sufficiently well your UV plane. If not, you need to use a model and try to fit your visibility measurements yeah, with uh, your model. So this is the first yeah, optical interferometer by Antoine Laberry and his associates. I think that Denis yeah, was also present yeah, when the first fringes were taken on Vega or not? Not with the not, not with that one. 74. 74. Later. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess the size of this telescope was something like 26 centimeters, right? Separated by baselines up to 140 meters. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. But it's very nice uh, to to see uh, what was made now. As you all know, yeah, when uh, you're observing a star, the star yeah, is uh, just uh, traveling in the sky. And so you see that the difference between the path lengths of the two light beams reaching the telescope yeah, is constantly changing as a function of time. Yeah? So when it is in the meridian, yeah, the path length difference is zero. But as you let the time go on, yeah, you have to compensate for that. And this is... Uh, it's the reason why you need delay lines, yeah? And it is what is represented here, yeah? So you have an optical delay line here, number two, here one, and you, you may move, yeah? Uh, these two <coughs> mirrors, yeah? Just to compensate yeah, for the difference in pass lengths, yeah? Well, first fringes with the I2T, yeah? By Antoine Laberry on Vega, yeah? Uh, very impressive, yeah? Now this was a grand interferometer at two telescopes, so the GI2T, and uh, it's very uh, <laughs> futurist yeah, still to look at uh, the dome, the laboratory, very nice, in Calerne. So briefly, remember that uh, our ancestors thought that the diameter of the stars uh, were about uh, two arc minutes or one arc minutes. Then Galileo, yeah, scale down it, uh, scale it down to five seconds of arc, yeah. Then uh, came uh, Michelson and Pease, yeah, measured, yeah, uh, the first angular diameter for Alpha Orionis, yeah, 47 arc, milli arc second. And well, later on, yeah, many many measurements made, uh, well, at Calerne, yeah, with. Uh, Grand telescope, grand interferometer at two telescopes, yeah, for, from which they could uh, derive effective temperature and angular radius, of course. Yeah. Well, here is a view on uh, the VLTI and uh, the way yeah, the beams are recombined in a co coherent way using, uh, of course, optical delay lines. Still another view. Well, I'm very proud that these four auxiliary telescopes were made in the edge, yeah, <laughs> in, my, in my city. Another view of a VLTI. It's very impressive to see that, you know, these four telescopes yeah, can be moved, yeah, well, from one night to another, yeah, in a different configuration, so that you better cover the UV plane, yeah? <coughs> okay, another view 
well, a view of another interferometer, the Shara interferometer, yeah, for which uh, I think uh, each of the telescopes have, has been equipped now with uh, adaptive optics. Yeah? So, uh, wonderful infrastructure. And many of you, yeah, I think, are using this facility with a very really long baseline. Okay, well, I think now the next one is a cake with a baseline of 85 meters, yeah, but a very big collector, but only one baseline. So, well, became also famous for uh, some knurling interferometry that has been made, yeah, using the cake. So you see here the laboratory, you know, with all the delay lines and uh, all the instruments, yeah, so it's very densely populated, a very high density of technology just there. And uh, in two days, yeah, there will be a presentation, yeah, of uh, ALMA and uh, well the similarities yeah, which exist between observing in some millimeter or at optical wavelengths or in the radio. Yeah. Now the big hope about 10, 10 years ago yeah, was to have a space interferometer yeah, but uh, well, the cost yeah, was extremely high and technology maybe not ready yet but now I think uh, it will become feasible in the near, near future. Now, well, I think uh, there, 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 there is just five minutes left, yeah? So what I wanted still to present, but, well, three hours is three hours, yeah? Is a fundamental theorem, then the wiener kinchin theorem. And, uh, well, I will just tell you what it is about, very briefly, the fundamental theorem, yeah? So it's still an application of the Zernike van Sittard theorem that had been presented by uh, France and uh, by me today, too, yeah? It's just the following, yeah? Well, when you have a telescope yeah, or an interferometer, yeah, it's easy yeah, from uh, the Zernike van Sitter theorem to demonstrate yeah, the following, that if it is a converging system, yeah, that the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane is just given by the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the entrance pupil plane. Yeah? So, well, the pupil plane yeah, is uh, at the level of the mirror. So let, let's assume you have a star yeah, with a light, uh, light rays uh, falling perpendicularly. So the, the flat front wave yeah, touch all the points of the pupil at the same time. So there is no phase difference nowhere. So it's just a constant. Yeah? So you could say, okay, the complex amplitude in the entrance pupil plane for that case is equal to 1 and zero outside the pupil. So now, just by taking the Fourier transform yeah, of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, you find what should be the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane. And now, you have the complex amplitude to get the intensity, you, you need to take the, mo the square of the module of that quantity, and you would find that for a circular aperture, you get the airy disk. It would give you an area disk. Now, for the case of an interferometer, you would say, OK, now we have two pupils, one pupil there, one pupil there, one over that one, one over that one, and zero everywhere else. Take the Fourier transform, and then you get the response function of an interferometer. Very simple, yeah? Then if you'd like to know what is the visibility, well, you need to convolve yeah, that response function in intensity yeah, with the shape of your source, yeah, when you would get the answer, yeah. So, well, the notes, the lecture notes will be available, yeah, and uh, there are video, yeah, which were made, yeah, during the Barcelona at school, because there, where well, we had seven hours, yeah, for the presentation, so we could go, yeah, deeper or in more details, yeah. So, I think I will stop here, because, well, uh, it's too short, yeah, to continue. <laughs> and then uh, I'm sure you will have the lunch at a quarter past one. Correct? So that's all. Well, if there are questions, yeah, maybe. Any question? No?